I'm saying? I hope you all had a good 10 minute break. Hope you grabbed your water, did a little stretch. I don't know if anyone saw, but I was definitely stretching on screen. I'm sure all of us are feeling a little stiff after a long day. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. I'm so, so excited for part two of this presentation, of this session. Um, let me just see, okay, perfect. So we're now gonna transition into part two of our Serving Underrepresented Survivors session. We are so thrilled to be joined by the LOL team. In case y'all aren't familiar, LOL is a SOAR member organization. They're based in New York City and they serve Bengali and Bangladeshi women and survivors. And we're so lucky to be joined by Sanjana Khan, their co-founder and executive director, Mohua, LOL's program and research coordinator, and Hamida, LOL's data and research manager. I think we're gonna put their full bios and links and everything in the chat in a second, but they're seriously some of like the sweetest, funniest people that I've ever like connected with. I'm sure you'll see, I just love their vibe. Um, so with all that being said, I will pass it off to you three. Hey everyone. Hey, let me share my screen. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Himadri, thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. Um, we're definitely an interesting bunch, so I hope you guys laugh with us as we do this. Um, so my name is Sanjana, my pronouns are she, they. Today we're gonna go over LOL's Reproductive Justice Initiative, which really looks at combating and ending sexual violence within our community, which is the Bangladeshi community in the Bronx in New York City. Do I change these? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so just a fun fact about me, um, I'm gonna be presenting uh, with Hamida and Bohua, but the fun fact I was, I've thought about it uh, that I'm gonna share is I used to be a drummer in a punk band when I was in college. Sorry guys. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Hamida Chimpa. I'm the data and research manager at LOL NYC. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and a fun fact about me today is that I feel like I just ran a marathon to get to this meeting. Uh, my bus was delayed. I was coming from work and I'm just really glad to be here. And I will pass <laughs> it off to Mahua. We're glad you made it, Hamida, for sure. So my name is Mohua Sultana. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the programs and research coordinator at LOL. And a fun fact about me is that I was captain of my Bollywood fusion dance team in college. <laughs> Oops, let me, I don't know what's going on. Okay. <laughs> let me continue. So, begin. yeah, so we're gonna be, I think it's really important to understand um, I, I we feel really lucky to present at SOAR. As a Bangladeshi founded organization working with the Bangladeshi community, we really want to give everyone a background of Bangladesh's history and how this has affected our community. Um, this unique form of gender-based violence that we've seen that does affect all of us in and how this is affected by his, historical, economic, and cultural factors. Um, it's a very multifaceted sex education. So we're not only talking about health, but we're also talking about holistic health. So we're talking about autonomy. We're talking about gender roles. We're also talking about it through an Islamic perspective. And we also, we're going to share the various metrics we use to evaluate the efficacy of our sex education. So um, growing up, talking about sexual health was always extremely taboo in my family and community. Growing up as a South Asian, as a Bangladeshi, as a Muslim woman, um, and even mentioning the word sex felt wrong. Like this, the culture that I grew up in made it very difficult to have any knowledge about my body. And so, you know, this brings up the question, like, how can women protect and advocate for their bodies if they don't know even the most basic things of the different parts of their body? So this is one activity from our curriculum that we ask our members who are part of the Reproductive Justice Initiative to do. And it's really simple. We just, you know, this is the human reproductive, um, the female reproductive system. Can you label these parts? So I'd love to do this as an icebreaker with you all. Um, and so I'm um, look, Moha, if you can start pointing to some of them and then we, we can ask folks in the chat to just 
try to label them. Um, so Muha, can you if you can point to can any you see one. my mouse? Yeah, like okay, okay, it's great, great. Okay, I'm gonna point to a random yeah. one. Yeah, maybe you can facilitate this part <laughs> since your mouse is moving. Oh. Yes, for sure. Okay, so um, does everybody see my mouse here? If you guys want, you can drop your answers in the chat and we can see. What do you think that part of the chart? And I just want to say, even if we don't know the whole point to icebreak, this is also is no matter what, we don't have the sex education. And someone just wrote that they don't know it in Bangla. And I don't think all of us know it in Bangla either. So English totally works. Yes. Yes. So does anyone know what that part Muho is pointing to is called? Yep. Okay. Uterus. Love it. Yes. Love we it. love the uterus. Yes. Um, and then okay. point to this one. Can do a few more. Yes. <clears throat> does anyone know what that part is? It's a little tricky. We can't. We can't answer right. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said Johnny. Joni, okay. Labia folds, yes. Labia so minora, I'm seeing labia majora. majora, labia minora. So it's actually the labia minora. The majora one is the outer layer. And then, um, Muhu, if you can point it to my favorite part of the diagram. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're talking about this. <laughs> no. No? <laughs> no. Wait, what the you part above. <laughs> Say that one more time. The part okay, above. Wait. I think okay. we should move on. I think we got okay. this. Yeah. Well, okay. so the, okay. the point of all of this is just to show that most of the women, you know, they're not familiar with any of these terms. And so even during the during the curriculum, we talk about like, do you know what the clitoris is? Do you know that it's it the organ was literally made for one reason? That's for pleasure. Like these are things that they're not that they never were exposed to. And so it's really important that we break the ice and have conversations like these. Next slide, please. Yes. Thank you, Hamida. So I just want to give a historical background about Bangladesh. Bangladesh was just born in the last 52 years. I think it's really important to connect this, especially with happening, what's happening in Palestine right now. Um, it was a mass genocide, um, the rape campaign. Um, there is no exact number, but we expect from 200 to 400,000 women were raped. Um, the US involvement in this, this was by the Nixon administration. Um, I think, you know, when I think back about the war, I was just like, why didn't America do anything? Why wasn't anyone concerned? Pretty much of what is happening in Palestine right now. And just to point out that we are the first generation that is not experienced a war, but also we're not living under direct colonial power. So this is something that's giving us the opportunities as Bangladeshis, looking back at our history and being like, why is there such high rates of DV? Why is there such high rates of SA? And that's a big, big part is because it is political. Everything we do in this world is political, especially the violence among women. And for us to kind of hone, on that, hone in on that was really important. Move on next slide, please. So kind of thinking about that context of how we were able to get our independence to bond issues in the US right now, the Bangladeshis have immigrated to the U.S. since the 1800s, but I think it's really important to note the majority of them do live in New York City, and that population specifically has grown by 41 percent from 2010 to 2019. And I think a lot of times the language that we use is very, like, defined so much. I don't think Bangladeshis, many of us were choosing to immigrate, like my own parents. I think a lot of it has to do with displacement, has to do with the fact that we don't have the resources because of war. And then, you know, it's a full on process, but also for climate reasons. Right now, Bangladesh is suffering from a huge climate crisis with land disappearing underwater. Um, this is the fifth largest immigrant group in New York City. I grew up in the Bronx. Um, the Bronx has always been overlooked in that population. Um, compared to other Asian ethnic groups, Bangladeshis are considered the poorest. And I think that's also very important because many times Bangladeshis are lumped in being Indian Americans, and that's just not the case for us. Um, there's 
so for us, when we really started LOL, we really wanted a space that was Bangladeshi women founded for Bangladeshi women. So, you know, we have a lot of partner organizations that are in New York, New York City that we also work with. But it's really, really important to know that we've been able to claim this space and we're reclaiming liberation for us. So myself and Aisha Akhtar, we're both from the Bronx. We're both Siliti. So also, I think pointing out the fact within Bangladesh, there is numerous indigenous communities, Silities being a indigenous language itself. Um, we we founded it, LOL, in 2018. Red, um, LOL means red. As you can see, we really try to color coordinate whenever we present. Um, it is really to show the resilience of Bangladeshi women. Um, Bangladeshi women also wear red alta. We wear a red teep. We wear red on our wedding day. The red sun is the center of the Bangladeshi flag. Um, so the reason is, as Aisha and I grew up, we were both survivors of DV, but also knew so many people in our community that's suffering from this, from our aunts to aunties on the block to cousins to sisters friends anyone like we knew this was common but we didn't have any space to go to so our goal was very simple just to be able to claim space in Norwood the Bronx because from the grocery stores from the mosque we just didn't have any space we could go to um, we were directly influenced by civil rights organizers and black leaders so just being able to be like not only are, are we creating a safe space but activists are also coming out of this space Oh, I forget. There's so many slides for me. Um. Anyways, uh, so a little bit more about LOL. So again, we're in Norwood, the Bronx, in the land of the Lenape people. Um, the Bronx is always considered, is the poorest, most underfunded, just overlooked borough in New York City. It has one of the fastest growing Bangladeshi populations right now. Um. We we're excited to share that we're probably a little bit higher than this now, but we're about 350 members at LOL. Um, average household income, this is from our own research that we've done when we did the census, was about 45,000 for a family of five. 70% of our members do not have jobs, but I just want to make it very clear that does not mean they, they aren't working because so much of our care economy is not counted as labor so our women are constantly working they are providing for their families they're caring for their families unfortunately they are not paid for it um 45 percent is um 45 percent of our members are recent immigrants um we actually we've talked there's so many sessions today about data and we'll get a little bit more into our data here but when law started we did start out with the needs-based assessment where we specifically asked 200 women exactly what they wanted. And this is where all of our programs came from, from our ESL to our citizenship prep, yoga, Bali X, our mental health initiative, and all and much more programs that we offer. Yes, no, it's mine. <laughs> all right, so sexual assault and domestic violence occur pretty often in South Asian American households, yet few people want to address it and the cause behind it. So there are a few statistics here, but I'm going to highlight um, one. So 80% of married women in Bangladesh experience intimate partner violence, which includes sexual, mental, physical abuse, as well as economic control. So as we know, many people do not share or report their situations, and that can happen for a number of reasons. One of them being trouble with identifying abuse. So many people may not know what all forms of, of abuse look like. And for some, intimate partner violence is normalized in relationships, which can blur the lines between love and abuse. Another reason is lack of language. So in English, we have many terms to describe these scenarios. And even just when talking about mental, physical, and sexual health, but not all of these terms exist in Bangla or even in other South Asian languages. So many people may not be able to identify um, or will not be able to like describe what is going on to others and to themselves. And one of the main underlying reasons that sexual assault and domestic violence are common is because of a lack of community support. So specifically in Bangladesh, marital rape is not an offense under the penal law of Bangladesh. So many of these cases end up going unheard. And this underreporting and concealment can cause survivors to feel shame, guilt, and even go into isolation. So if we 
step away from Bangladesh and focus in on the Bronx, the Bronx has one of the highest rates of intimate partner violence due to the lack of resources and because there aren't any domestic violence shelters. And I think it's also important to note that there's only one Muslim domestic violence shelter in New York City. So overall, I think we can see that there is a lack of resources for domestic violence and sexual assault survivors. However, there's an even bigger lack for South Asian Americans because of language accessibility and the stigma against those who report it. Um, this is me, right? Okay, cool. <laughs> I also, with Mohua, kind of just adding to that last slide is, you know, this is also very common in the U.S., no matter where we are. So the layer of being in the U.S. and shame of, like, not being able to tell anyone of what's going on is a huge factor within our community. So kind of going into how Reproductive Justice Initiative, the RJI started at LOL, um, uh, I I was a bird doula before I started LOL, and I've worked very closely with the North Central Bronx midwifery. So after I started LOL, um, the head midwife, Denise, who is actually on our board right now, um, incredible board member. I don't know if she's on the call, but whatever. Um, yay, Denise. But she she reached out to us because there were so many new mothers giving birth at at the midwifery that had no lack of education or had no idea what was going on and they didn't have the language. So she reached out being like, is this something we could partner with you guys with? Because what they noticed, a lot of the nurses and midwives was the husbands were making a lot of the decisions when it came to, let's say, um, a cesarean or whatnot. Like they could tell that the, it wasn't being translated to the patient or making her decision the woman being able to make her decision herself. So with that, there was, we got, kind of went into our own research, honestly, um, just a big shout out to Hamida who did so much of this grant research from the back end. So noticing that there's high levels of cervical cancer, breast cancer, diabetes, endometriosis, and anemia. How do we get this all into our curriculum? So we, um, we started off with 45 women. It did cut down um, the, um, we start off with 45 women. Currently we, from our first cycle, about 28 graduated. So just kind of showing you where it started from and then how it went down. But 56% of the law women were not mar um, were married before the age of 17. And again, this has to do so much with the war because there was such a threat to women because of the rape done by the Pakistani army. It was almost a safety precaution to get women married quicker and younger. 12% um, were married at 15 or younger. One in, one in eight re received any form of edu sex education. And then also just tying it back to Roe versus Wade. Um, we knew at LOL that Roe versus Wade was going to overturn. And then we kept thinking about how do we make sure the women that are so marginalized have a voice in this space can actually be the ones leading these and being able to be like, no, this actually affects me. So kind of not only talk, thinking about health, education, violence, but also the right to abortion. And then how do we tie this and make sure our community is not being left over? Um, And then this um statistic we have that 80% of law members face some sort some form of dv before we started rji um lol did a very comprehensive mental health case study so from our mental health case study we were able to see that our members were facing different types of domestic violence but this wasn't something anyone ever thought was out of the norm so how can we even educate or talk about something that is so culturally I would even say preserved or culturally is so comfortable. Culturally is what we know is quote unquote love. All right. So from everything that we've discussed so far, is there anything that like surprised you guys? We would love to hear your comments. You can drop it in the chat. Um, Hamida and Sanjana, I'm just going to ask if you can just monitor the chat. Yeah. And if any folks also want to unmute themselves, they, yeah. they can do that as well. So I'm reading someone said that seeing so many overlaps between what's being shared right now and what was shared about LGBTQ plus survivors. And as someone said, we need more South Asian doulas and more full spectrum doulas. Yes, we will actually, we actually have exciting news about a doula initiative that we're working with. And then someone said, thanks for sharing very useful data and excellent presentation. Please keep touch with us. 
Fifteen percent of our current clientele is Bangladeshi. Yes, thank you. All right. I'm going to go to the next slide. <laughs> so we really want this to be interactive. So thank you so much for sh sharing so many comments and thoughts in the chat box. You can also unmute at any point. Um, we really, we also want to know, like, did you ever receive any form of sex, sex education? And if so, what was that experience like? Um, across all 30 of our members who are were a part of the Reproductive Justice Initiative, we found that this program was actually the first time they ever received any form of like sex education, formal or informal. And so lack of sex education is, is a phenomenon that we've been seeing across all age groups. Um, I live in New York City and I went to school here. Um, and even in my sex ed class, our teacher didn't feel comfortable with saying the word sex. He would say the S word. And I even remember at some points that teacher was unavailable. So the janitor was teaching and it was just a whole mess. And it, it was very clear to me that sex education is not a priority in education. Um, so I'd love to hear if any of you guys have any horror stories like mine, or maybe it wasn't a horror story, it was actually pleasant. Feel free to let us know. We'd love to hear. Someone said, in the South, there's a focus on abstinence, yes. It's, it's actually interesting. Um, in the U.S., only about 29 states mandate sex education. Only 13 are required to be scientifically accurate. And only one state actually incorporates consent in the curriculum. So it's very... It's someone, said, I remember, someone said, I remember the boys in class pretty much wouldn't pay attention the whole time. <laughs> barely received it through school and I think family tried but for me being queer what, what made it difficult is, was yeah in all situations the irony of education getting a period while attending Islamic school oh you guys are sorry this chat is active Stop it. <laughs> I love it yes. never got education on sex before marriage yes my mom oh. did not either yeah, I think I think just time wise, Hamida, I feel like it's gonna pop off for days. Thank you, know? you guys. Um, next. So, um, there's a common misconception that sex education is just about safe sex and uh, avoiding unintended pregnancies. Um, and while these topics are very important, most people don't realize that comprehensive sex education also talks about your hormones, your rights as a patient, how to have healthy relationships, how to identify signs of violence, pleasure, and so much more. And so it's really important that we demystify what sex education can be about so we can promote more of it um, and encourage schools and educational settings to implement this. Um, and, and in our curriculum, we go over all these topics because we believe that edu women need education in order to make informed decisions about their body. Next slide, please. All right, so program development at LOL. So joy is a big theme at LOL and we center our work around joy. So as a program coordinator at LOL, one of my jobs is to ensure that our members are enjoying LOL's programs and they're getting a return in their investment. So one of the main questions that we will ask ourselves once we start a new program is, will this program provide the resources Bengali women need to live healthy, engaged and joyful lives? So let me just do a quick rundown on the program development. So first, we always start off with a needs-based assessment. This basically tells us what programs the community needs and what programs they want. We then go into research and basically figure out how we can implement these programs for the community. And within this research stage, we try to see if there are any partnerships that will assist us in the implementation. We then plan and design the program, and then we pilot uh, the program to our members. And one of the main things um, that we need to keep in mind is that there needs to be transparent documentation. So not only for our research, but for donors and stakeholders as well. And at LAL, we also like to get the community involved. We think about how we can integrate the community members in the development and decision-making processes. And then we also measure program impact through pre and post assessments, which we'll discuss further on um, in our presentation. So after the program is done, um, we basically build on what worked and what didn't work so that the next cycle can be better and that our members can get the most out of what they signed up for. So just to sum up program development in general, so at LAL, we basically aim to provide the resources that the community needs through 
a joyful way. And we make sure to keep track of the data and the testimonials that come out of our programs. Yeah, and I think I think just to add on that last slide, Mohua, if you can just go back. Yes. Um, just that community-centric approach, I think just to be able to highlight it in program development, like even though for RJI, and then Hamida will go a little bit into it too, we we actually asked again too, right? Like even though there was a need from the midwifery, we wanted we were very nervous to do the program. None of us are married. We're working with a very Muslim community to talk about sex, to talk about any of this was really hard. But it was because that the community members were willing and were interested. They were like, no, we would like to see what this is. What would this be like at the hospital? Hence why we were able to approach it. So again, being able to know that the community wants this and needs this. So just being able to highlight that. Thanks, Mahua, just went to that. And so as we mentioned, as Sanjana just said, North Central Bronx originally reached out to us after they saw that a large portion of the patients they serve are Bengali speaking. And one interesting phenomenon they observed was if, even in the hospital setting, when the gynecologist is asking the mother questions, it's the husband that's answering for them. It's the husband that's speaking for them. Even though these are questions that, you know, the mother is experiencing, it's her lived experience that she should be confident enough to answer. And so this brought on the need we need to allow for, we need to promote autonomy for the women. We need to give them education and um, improve the health literacy so that they, they can make better informed decisions about their body. And so um, our... RGI was informed by the need from the hospital, the need in general from our needs assessment survey, and just research about the high prevalence of cervical cancer, the, the low rates of pap smears and things like that. So that um, kind of informed the RGI, and we spent about two and a half years designing this curriculum, which is about four, six to eight week cycles. So that's about 30 to 40 ish chapters of material. Um, and for this pilot program, we, we took one cohort of 30 women and put them through four cycles. Um, and we'll talk more about what each cycle consisted of in terms of content. Um, and throughout these cycles, we've been collecting data, which I will speak more about on the later slides. Um, after cycle four, we will begin to evaluate our program to really assess the efficacy of sex education and understand has our program made an impact on their lives. Um, we're hoping that these findings will inform a policy report that could, you know, suggest things like mandating comprehensive sex education or promoting having more bilingual staff in healthcare settings. And then the last component that we're hoping is an outcome is something that we've actually been launching, we're, we're actually launching right now, um, and I'm excited to say that we've partnered with Bronx Rebirth, which is a doula nonprofit, and we're currently training our members who have gone through this reproductive justice initiative to become doulas. Um, there's research that shows that doulas positively impact maternal and infant health outcomes. And so we really want the women to become leaders in that space. Um, and I myself, as well as Mahua, will also be taking this course. Um, and I'm really excited to support Bengali mothers in labor. And then I also just want to add that this workforce development component is so crucial to this space about sexual and reproductive health because financial freedom is intrinsic to violence prevention. Thank you for that, Hamida. So this is a basic overview of our RJI curriculum. So once again, RJI is the first sex education in Bangla in the U.S., and our goal is to help women understand how to make their own decisions when it comes to their health. So um, like we've said, the program basically consists typically of like 30 participants, all from different age ranges. Um, we follow the same group of people for four semesters in a one year long curriculum. And we do have a few Pakistani and Indian members, so we do cater to them as well. Uh, and then throughout the cycles, we want women to know why their bodies function the way they do and the sexual rights that they have. So in cycle one and cycle two, we focus more on physical health. So topics like nutrition, holistic health, menopause, menstruation, preventative health, um, stuff like that. And then in cycle three, we get into more concepts such as motherhood, pregnancy, postpartum depression. And then in cycle four is when we really get into the nitty gritty of certain stigmatized topics, topics, sorry, I can't even speak, such as domestic violence, healthy relationships, abortion, and sex and pleasure. 
So as you can see, we gradually progressed with each cycle to discuss the topics that are the most stigmatized in order to build that trust and create that space to share intimate stories. Um, in cycle four, we, we talk about sex and pleasure, but we talk about it specifically through an Islamic perspective because majority of our member base is Bangladeshi Muslim. Uh, Sanjana, Hamida, and I are also Bangladeshi Muslim. So when creating RJI, it was very important for us to know how we can talk about these topics in a way that is relatable to our member base and to us. Um, I think Sanjana had said this previously, so majority of Bangladesh's population is Muslim, so they come with faith being their guide. So when talking about sex and intimacy, we cannot rule out the role of religion and how it shapes people's relationships, um, which is why we took this approach. And then in the next few slides um, that we'll be going over, I'll just be going deeper into the topics of cycle four. Um, I also want to add each of our members that do participate in each cycle, they get a $200 stipend. So not only do they get to participate in this, they also get paid for it because, again, we do acknowledge that they are leaving work to be able to be part of our programs and work as in taking care of the entire family. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here is an example of chapter two. So chapter two is for identifying abuse. And in this chapter, um, this is just an example of one of the charts. We list different forms of abuse and some examples of how this is shown. We also have Bangla translations for everything so that we can build the language to talk about these situations. Um, and then moving on to chapter three, this is um, where we talk about sex and pleasure through a cultural and Islamic perspective. So in this chapter, we talk about sex and intimacy in Islam, and we dive into examples from religious texts and teachings that showcase the importance of pleasure and communication in sexual relationship. Um, it is important to note here that in Islam, sex is technically permissible only between married couples, um, but that is not the view that we're trying to establish with RJI. The RJI space is a safe and judgment-free zone and but because our member base is mostly Muslim, the religious teachings offer an insight on sex and pleasure in a culturally sensitive and culturally specific way. Um, just my thoughts on this chapter. This is actually one of my favorite chapters. I never thought I would be in a room talking to older Bengali women about sex so comfortably. And when we're trying to, basically when we're trying to figure out um, how we're gonna talk about these topics, it, like Sanjana said, like none of us are married, none of us have children, and technically we're not supposed to be having sex prior to marriage. Um, but the curiosity and the acceptance that we received from our members was honestly unmatched. It, it felt like we were just a bunch of friends talking about our sex lives and how we can basically accumulate pleasure in our lives. Um, and when creating this uh, lesson plan, I myself learned a lot of new things as well. So for example, in Islam, having sex is a good deed that is synonymous to charity. So all my <laughs> married Muslim couples <laughs> go do some good deeds <laughs> and some charity work. Um, I just um, want to also add yes. that... Um, every aspect of this curriculum was intentional. Like my goal was for someone to open this book and know that this was made for Bengali women. And so from the images you see to the examples about um, what what a role play conversation could be like to, to talking about chronic disease like diabetes and PCOS, that's um, very common for South Asians. I really wanted someone to know that this was made for them and that they felt seen through this curriculum. And so, as you can see, there's, you know, lots of references to Bengali culture, lots of references to Islamic culture, and, and um, yeah. So to, add. Um, to add on to this, too, it's so exciting to see how much of our members have opened up. I think it's really important to state in the first semester, no one would make eye contact from the clitoris images. No one would make eye contact when they said sex. No one. And now... It's so great to have conversations even after class like, oh, you know what, I tried, I tried this, but this isn't working. Maybe this is the kind of lubricant I would like to use. This is the pleasure I would like. What can I do with my husband to create more pleasure in our, so, because I believe that, you know, even us, I think we were being very like, oh, we're going to get judged. We're, they're not going to want to talk to us about this. 
we were so afraid to talk to about this because, oh, it's a Muslim community. Oh, it's a community that doesn't know. But it's because we had so much trust that has already built out law. This was so easy that now that as we do our second cohort, so many of the women are actually registering their daughters because they're like, this is imperative knowledge that they we don't get to go get from anywhere else. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, I love talking about clitoris. I love talking about a lot of pleasure in my life. So it's really great that we can do it fully with our members. Okay. And then there's just one more example that I want to share with you guys. So chapter four, we talk about promoting healthy sexual relationships. So on this slide, we have an example of an activity from chapter four, which is basically talking about how we can maintain healthy sexual relationships. So having activities that help our members exercise and practice the information that they have received helps them apply it in real life. So in this specific activity, we basically gave our members scenarios of a couple that is having trouble in their relationship. Um, and then our members are asked how this situation can be overcome through communication. So we have many activities throughout all of the cycles and they serve as like a checkpoint to ensure that our members are understanding what is being taught and also so they can apply it to their, um, apply their skills in the real life world as well. So um, for the data, we mentioned that data is so, so pivotal to the work at law. We want the data to inform the program design, but we also continue to collect data during the program to ensure that it's making an impact and that our objectives are being met um, and that we can learn how can we make this better for future iterations. Um, and so when we, an, a, a big component of this data collection is disaggregating data. As you may know, um, a lot of traditional data reports kind of um, generalize all of Asian American Pacific Islander information into one monolith of information. Like, um, like you'll see a statistic that says Asian Americans are X percent more likely for Y. And it's just, it's not accurate to the whole, it's not accurate to each culture that exists in Asia. You know, there's hundreds upon thousands of different dialects and cultures and ethnicities. And so our goal is to really figure out what data is specific to the Bangladeshi American community here in New York City. Um, and so that's why it's so important that we ask questions to the community um, throughout the course of our programs. And so when we think about the impact that the Reproductive Justice Initiative made, we really think about how do you even begin to measure health literacy? How do you measure the fact that um, they're feeling more comfortable talking about sex or that they're seeking these different um, health prevention measures? Um, so we do it through pre and post assessments. Um, in the beginning, before the cycle begins, we, we ask questions. Like, do you know what um, a pap smear is? Um, and then we also ask questions about the, their current health seeking behaviors. So we'll ask questions like, how often do you see a gynecologist? Um, have you experienced a currently experience irregular menstruation? How comfortable do you feel talking about sexual health with your doctor or with your family? Um, how confident do you feel in making decisions about your health? And then we ask those same questions after the end of each cycle. So across the four cycles, we're then able to track any changes in health literacy and in health seeking behaviors. And then um, another component that we also track is just their interest. What topics are they even interested about? Um, what do they want to learn about and how, how can we incorporate that into our lesson so that it's interactive and engaging and useful for them? And then our assessments also ask about any resources that they've requested from all of this knowledge. We really want to show that education is a return on investment for hospitals, for, for institutions. You know, if you can invest in preventive health in the long run, you do save money um, because they're not getting sick or they're not having all these other diseases that, you, that health insurance will pay for. So that's just on the, the technical end that, you know, return on investment is good to keep in mind. But I think our biggest goal is to make sure that they feel more autonomy over their bodies. And so how do you even begin to measure that? Um, we we take quality of data very seriously. So during each class, we do have a note taker to check what questions are they asking? Um, what, how are they responding? How is their comfort level? What, what, 
what are the observations we're seeing in the classroom setting? And then over time, as Sanjay mentioned, we're, we're seeing that, you know, they're asking more questions specific to their health. They went from, you know, looking away when we talk about sex to now um, raising their hand and wanting to talk and like asking questions to their friends and doing their own research. Um, so it's really great to be able to see that change. Next slide. So these are some of our preliminary findings. Um, we're currently in the evaluation phase, so we hope to share more for you um, after that's finalized. But we have seen that there um, is an 80% increase in reproductive knowledge. Um, there's been a 10% increase in pap smears being done, a 72% increase in the women checking for breast cancer symptoms themselves, um, a 70% increase in discussing reproductive health with their with their doctors, um, a 70% increase in regularly seeing and planning to see a healthcare provider. Um, so that's very exciting. This is a quote from one of our classes. Um, someone said, I have opened up a lot from cycle one to four. Talking about sex is a taboo part of our culture. For RGI, cycle four has helped me talk about these topics to my husband and to my kids. I hope everyone, men and women in our community can have access to this information. I also just want to add that um, a, a few weeks ago, one of the ladies who w went through these four cycles came to my house um, for a dawat, and she was just telling me with how she showed the curriculum to her husband, uh, made her made him read it, and now he's excited about this information. And he wants um, he wants a workshop for the men in the community, and that's actually a demand that we're seeing that now the men are interested. They want to learn, you know, um, and that I think is revolutionary, and we're really excited to continue to work in that space. And I just want to end on one note um, for the data end. Um, I really believe that comprehensive sex education provides the necessary tools for people to make informed decisions regarding their sexual well-being, um, in developing like healthy identities and advocating for themselves when facing gender-based violence. So kind of on Hamida's point, we're so excited to say that we are launching a curriculum for Bangladeshi men. It's something we have been doing research with. If there is any Bangladeshi men you all know in New York City that would like to help us teach this curriculum, we are on the lookout. Um, we are also really excited to say that we did launch our doula training. It We have a partner with Bron the BX Rebirth Collective. Like Hamida mentioned, Mohua and herself will be becoming a birth doula, but we will also have death doulas, prenatal doulas, full spectrum doulas. I was the only Bangladeshi doula in New York City for a minute. So I'm excited to say that now through law, we're going to have so many doulas. Um, our dream is to have a birth clinic that is run by and for Bangladeshi women and kind of everything connected is so much of our workforce development. So no matter when we talk about sexual violence, we have to talk about financial independence. And that's something that has been on Lal's mind and what we think about when we do programming. So we have been working on our um, sewing cooperative that is also working with a lot of our RJI participants. You know, we really um, kind of like Hamida said, we really, really want to address these issues holistically within our community. We want to see more like, like collect, like, how, how do I say it was the right term for this? But we want to be able to address what's going on within our community by our community. We don't want to include law enforcement. We don't want to go through a punitive, shameful method. We want to be able to hold the people we love responsible and accountable in a way that is healing. We do want to expand into other neighborhoods with Bangladeshi, large Bangladeshi populations. But again, we want this to be done very organically. We want folks to come and join us from these communities and that can bring them back to their neighborhoods. And of course, really thinking about disaggregating data and writing policy memos. All right, so that concludes our presentation. I wanna thank all of you for your time. I really hope you enjoyed this presentation and I hope that it was informative. Um, if you want to know more about LAL, what we're doing and how you can support us, please check us out on social media. You can also go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter. I just want to point out like LAL would not be where it is without the support and love from our community. And it's because of supporters that we're able to continue this work. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Our emails are listed right here. Um, and I hope you guys all enjoy the rest of the summit and the rest of your day.
Um, do we open it up for questions? We can definitely open it up for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I just want to say thank you. You guys did a great job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You too, Sanjana. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, we also, also want to say our gala is coming up. We haven't secured the date yet, but it will be in June. And I do want to say we all love to party at LOL. So if you're trying to party, come through. But yes, any questions? And if not, we're always, we love, we love to get off the Zoom too. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. If folks do have questions, definitely please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm also going to put the resource goodie bag in the chat that has these amazing people's contact information so that you can reach out to them and just connect with them. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to the three of you. That was such an engaging and educational presentation. I learned so much. I know others did as well. Uh, we're so inspired by your work, not only in serving underrepresented survivors and communities, but also in program development and data. Like that's a training topic that folks keep asking us for, which we've really struggled to break down, but y'all did it so beautifully. So it's just amazing to see the connections between your presentation and the other presentations today. Um, I think we're going to launch a quick feedback poll, speaking of data, um, but I did just want to take a minute to uplift um, some of SOAR's repro justice work that we hope can support all of your organizations. These are all in your resource goodie bag, but I'm just putting in the chat our sexual and repro health and wellness advocate toolkit, as well as our South Asians for Abortion Hub and Abortion Care Guide in 20 South Asian languages. Also putting LOL's Repro Justice Initiative um, one pager in the chat as well. Um, I know these are a lot of links, but that's why we call it a goodie bag to make it fun. Um, so thank you again to LOL and also to Bumika from AFSA for such a wonderful presentation. We're about to go into a 15 minute break after which we'll have our final session of the day and the summit, which is so hard to believe. Our closing address starts at the hour with the amazing folks from Jahaji Sisters, Shivana and Simone. You definitely won't want to miss it. So I think we'll get our break slide up in just a second. Um, hope everyone has a good break and see y'all back very, very soon. Thank you so, so much.